Welcome back everybody. This is our third video on improper integrals. In this video, we're going to handle the case of improper integrals with discontinuous integrands. That sounds like a fun topic, huh? So we're going to start with this example where I want you to notice we do not have infinity. It's not anywhere in here. And yet there is something amiss. Let, let's see why. So if I try to compute this the way I'm accustomed to computing these things, I'm going to find an antiderivative. So an antiderivative is going to be negative 1 over x. And then I'm going to evaluate this at negative 1 and 1, find the net difference. So let's see, at 1 I get negative 1 minus, uh, let's see, at negative 1 I get uh, minus 1. So I end up with negative 2. Cool. Okay, fine. I evaluated the integral. I get negative 2. What? You don't think it should be negative 2? Why not? Positive. 1 over x squared is positive. Oh, gosh. Oh, my God. You're, you're right. Yes. 1 over x squared is, is always positive, right? I mean, that, that, yeah, you shouldn't get a negative answer when you integrate a positive function. What, what went wrong here? Okay, if we draw a picture of 1 over x squared, we can see what may have gone wrong. On the left-hand side of this arrow, or rather the right-hand side, we see that the function is going up to infinity. Of course, the other side, symmetric, is also going up to infinity. The area here really should be positive. But it's not. It's negative 2. Where's the disconnect? Well, it's not a disconnect. It's a discontinuity. 1 over x squared has a discontinuity when x is equal to 0. Right? These blow up. There's a vertical asymptote there. And if you recall, you don't? Oh, yeah, you should, though. The fundamental theorem of calculus actually has a hypothesis that tells you your function is supposed to be continuous on the interval where you integrate. If we're integrating from negative 1 to 1, the function should be continuous from negative 1 to 1. But it's not. There's a discontinuity at 0. Okay, we have an issue. How are we going to handle this? Well, okay. It seemed like when we had uh, infinite limits we should actually use limits to handle the problem, right? If you can't go all the way to infinity, well, go part of the way and then keep pushing out further and further. So we're going to try the same thing here, only now we're not going off to infinity, we're getting closer and closer to a point of discontinuity. So instead of computing it in this sort of naive way, instead we're going to break this up. We're going to break it up into two pieces. So I break it up first as the integral from negative 1 to 0. Why did I pick 0? Because that's where the discontinuity is. And then I'll integrate from 0 to 1. So I'm going to integrate the left and the right. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll say those should give you the same answer. This function is symmetric. And you're right. So let's just look at the right-hand side. Okay. So if I want to compute the integral from 0 to 1, well, I'm not really allowed to compute this integral from 0 to 1. It's not continuous at 1. So what I'm going to do is replace 0 by some value slightly bigger than 0. So the integral from 0 to 1, I'm going to replace it by an integral from, say, a to 1. And well, what is this a? Well, it's going to be some quantity which I'm going to compute and then push it closer and closer to zero. So I'll take a limit. Uh, of course, I take a limit as a approaches zero. From which side? Well, we're going in towards zero from the right. So I put a little positive sign here. So this is how I'm going to compute an improper integral which is what we have here. Whenever you have a discontinuity in the middle, we'll call that an improper integral. This is how I'm going to compute when I have a discontinuity. I'm going to remove the discontinuity right, by letting the integral get closer and closer to that discontinuity point, but not actually letting it equal it. 
Okay, well, all right, I go through the, the normal game here. I compute an antiderivative, keeping my limit around. Antiderivative is negative 1 over x. I compute it between a and 1. And let's see, I still have a limit. Uh, I evaluate at the endpoint. So I get, let's see, negative 1 minus, minus is plus 1 over a. Now what is happening as a goes to 0 to 1 over a? Well, a is getting smaller and smaller. As the denominator gets smaller, the fraction gets bigger and bigger and bigger. As a goes to 0, this thing blows up. So this guy goes to infinity. And this explains why we're going to have a little bit of problem when we try to compute this. The area doesn't actually converge to some number. This guy here diverges. Right? Well, we only proved one half of it diverges, but if one half does, the other one must diverge as well. Okay. So this is how we can compute an improper integral where we have a point of discontinuity somewhere in the middle. Okay. I'm going to wipe this away. We'll do another example, and then I'll give you a discontinuous integrand version of the p-test. Okay, let's try another example. Here we're going to integrate from 2 to 6, 1 over root x squared minus 4. In the trig substitution series, you may have learned, oh yeah, we should do a little trig substitution here when we see that x squared minus a squared. That's true. But there's a more pressing problem here. If I try to evaluate at 2, I end up dividing by 0. And that's no bueno. We are not allowed to divide by zero when we do puppies get kicked. Don't kick puppies. So we're going to have to set this up with a limit. Right? We're going to have to replace this two by some value and then we'll let the value get closer and closer to two. So we rewrite this as a limit as x approaches two, again from above, the integral from, eh, we'll still use a, to 6 dx over root x squared minus 4. Okay, now it's at this point that you can say, oh yeah, I want to do a trig substitution. Sweet. Okay, let's do a trig substitution. So here the trig substitution would be x equals 2 secant of theta, so that your dx will be 2 secant of theta tangent of theta d theta. All right, with this substitution, well, I'm going to actually skip ahead. I'm going to let you uh, pause the video here and uh, try to work through some of these details. Uh, but I'm going to jump it ahead here and pause. Work details. Eh? We're learning? Okay, here I go. So once we jump ahead, Okay, we keep the limit around, right? We're always keeping our limit around. This ends up reducing to 2 times the absolute value. Oh, excuse me, I got this in the wrong order. 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of the secant of theta plus the tangent of theta. And we have to evaluate this as theta runs from the arc secant of a over 2 up to the arc secant of 3. Okay, so if you got a different answer, might go back, check, make sure you're getting to the same place. This here is the antiderivative for secant, so that should tell you what happens when you go through here and uh, do all your simplifications. Okay, so uh, what's next? Well, we have to plug these in. When we plug these in, we end up with another limit. And we get 2 times the natural log absolute value of 3 plus the tangent of the arc secant of 3. Uh, let's see, 1, 2 parentheses, so we better put an absolute value here, minus the natural log of the absolute value of a over 2 plus the tangent of the arc secant 
of a over 2. And close parenthesis. Now, all of this stuff, just numbers to compute, they're just constants. What we're really interested in is this limit. And oh, we've been, we've been writing x, haven't we? Haha. <laughs> OK, this is going to be a mistake that is so easy to make. And you're going to make it. Go back and check at the end. It's not the x that's approaching 2, right? It's the a that's approaching 2. So all these should be a's approaching 2. And that's what we're interested in, is what's happening as a approaches 2. So a over 2, as a approaches 2, is going to 1. And the same thing here, a over 2 is going to 1. Of course, now you get to look at the arc secant of 1 and then compute the tangent of it. But the nice thing is when we take this limit, everything is going to something finite, something nice <coughs> and easily computable. And if you simplify this, you end up with 2 times the natural log of 3 plus 2 root 2. Okay? The final answer is not so important. Okay? It's good for you to make sure you can go through and do all the work. It's the setup that's the important part. I mean, once we get through this first line, <coughs> you'll notice we're just doing trig substitution. We're just back to solving our integrals. We have to do one little limit observation at the end. The trick is noticing. I can't just <coughs> apply the fundamental theorem like normal. I have to use a limit here. All right, we're going to clean this all up. And right, we're going to do that p-test I promised. All right, be back in a second. OK, so we're going to finish with the p-test. And I'm not doing this to try to confuse you, because we already had a p-test. This really is going to look very, very similar. The reason I do it is because, one, when you solve problems, you should have some way of, I don't know, having a little intuition as to what the answer is when you start the problem. And we have that when we had improper integrals with infinite limits. If you could somehow compare it to a function that looked like 1 over x to the p, you'd get a good sense from the beginning. Does this converge or diverge? And it would be nice to have one of those when you're doing discontinuous integrand improper integrals as well. So very quick, again, we're going to be looking at function to the form 1 over x to the p. Only here, we're going to be interested near 0. We can use 0 sort of as a proxy for other points of discontinuity. You can always shift your functions left, right, and that won't make much of a difference. But that's why we're going to use 0 here. And I don't really care what the upper bound is. And typically, I'm not expecting it to be infinity or anything. So the question is, is this going to converge or diverge? And the answer, again, is going to depend on p. And it's basically sort of the opposite answer. So this is going if p is at least 1. So before we saw if p was greater than 1, then it would converge. Well, when we're looking at a discontinuous integrand, and we have a discontinuity at 0, if p is too big, now this function is going to diverge. And if p is less than 1, then the integral will converge. So this is going to be nice to know, right? If you see something like the integral 1 over x plus 4, x goes from negative 4 to, say, negative 2. Well, now you have a discontinuity at negative 4. Shift this over, right? OK, make this just an x instead of an x plus 4. The discontinuity is at 0, right? You do a u substitution, u equals x plus 4. All right. This is telling you, though, that you're essentially in the p equals 1 case. And in the p equals 1 case, you know that the integral is going to diverge. So you can immediately recognize it is. You still should go through the process. Use your limit, figure out what's going on, right? Show that it, it actually does diverge. Your, your teacher's really going to appreciate that you do. But it's really good when you start a problem to know what the answer is going to be when you finish. Okay? So have fun playing with this. You might be able to write down some other uh, tests for other different types of functions. Makes it even easier for you to do comparisons. Have at it. Play around with it. Have some fun with the math.